The federal government has restated that in spite of media reports, military men did not shoot protesters at the Lekki toll gate on October 20. At a media briefing, Information Minister Lai Mohammed challenged those who lost anyone to the incident to come forward and testify before any of the judicial panels. He recalled the demands of the NSAS protesters and government's prompt response. However, he said fake news on the social media had reinforced government resolve to regulate social media. Uh, he did not spare human rights organization for allegedly not acknowledging fatalities among security personnel. His comment came a day after a report by U.S.-based media CNN showed Nigerian soldiers shooting at unarmed protesters at a lucky target. The minister said CNN should be sanctioned as he engaged in incredible sensationalism and did not do a great dis did a great disservice to itself and to journalism. Meanwhile, few hours after the minister expressed the government's the federal government was responsive and responsible in meeting the demands of the NSAS protesters. B, the irresponsible use of the social media by some unscrupulous persons aggravated the violence that erupted in the wake of the NSAS protest and helped to precipitate the violence. While the government has no plans to shut down the internet, it will work with stakeholders to regulate the social media to curb abuse. C, those who use the social media responsibly have nothing to fear. But those who abuse it have every reason to be worried. As no responsible government will stand by and allow a few unscrupulous elements to set the country ablaze. D, CNN goofed in its preconceived stance that the soldiers who were deployed to Lekki Toll Gate indeed shot at protesters, killing some of them. CNN relied heavily on unverified and possibly doctored videos as well as information sourced from questionable sources to reach its conclusion. This should end CNN as serious sanction for irresponsible reporting. E, while judicial panel sitting in Lagos works to unravel what really transpired at the Lekki Toll Gate, available evidence so far points to the world's first case of massacre without blood or bodies. F, the federal government commends the security agencies for acting professionally and showing utmost restraint all through the NSAS protest and ensuring and ensuing violence, an action that saved lives and properties. G, human rights organizations should note that the security agents are also human beings and they have rights too. Even if the organizations, for whatever reasons, are reluctant to recognize the human rights of security agents, they should stop vilifying them as they are wont to do. It's also disheartening that the human rights organizations have not seen anything wrong in the mindless violence that was perpetrated in the name of answers. H. DJ Switch should quit peddling falsehood and present her case with verifiable evidence to the judicial panel sitting in Lagos. No agency of government has declared her wanted. Hence, she has no reason fleeing or seeking asylum anywhere. I, the sanctions imposed on some broadcast media organizations by the National Broadcasting Commission are justified in view of the unprofessional acts of the organizations which were in clear breach of the broadcasting code as stated by the commission. It is also imperative for the traditional media to authenticate information from the social media before before pushing such to the public.
the federal government is very satisfied <laughs> with the role played by the security agencies, especially the military and the police, all through the NSAS crisis. Six soldiers and 37 policemen were killed all over the country during the crisis. This is in addition to 196 policemen who were injured, 164 police vehicles that were destroyed, and 134 police stations that were raised. Meanwhile, a few hours after the minister expressed her government's plan to punish the United States-based television CNN remained unyielding as it repeated the report at the end and it said it stood by it, adding that it was carefully and meticulously researched. Lots of back and forth this morning. Tundu, you're, you're weighing in this. Well, we've discussed this ad nauseum, haven't we? And it's simply not going away. I mean, with CNN, let's not fall into that vulgar, white is right belief that everything foreign is automatically perfect. Because you definitely will recall that this is not the first time CNN is crossing swords with the federal government of Nigeria. Remember that MEND documentary that happened that the government completely refuted and the consequences thereof. But the point here Jeff for Konegi. me... Yes. I was going to say... Yeah. I was trying to be... But he wasn't sacked because of the report. That was yeah. in 2007. Okay. He was sacked because he was accused of having induced... Uh, the militants. And, you know, okay. CNN saw that as a bribery. bribery uh, you know, the there are standards. Okay. You don't need to bribe people yeah. to get information. But it was around that. So That's I'm trying to be discreet. Yeah. I'm not yeah. talking about an individual. Okay. I'm just making a general point yeah. Yeah. about this not being the first time with CNN. So it's not like we're being presented something as the Nigerian public and must accept it hook, line, and sinker because it came from America, as I've seen some people do. I don't think we should do that because... Nigerian broadcasters, such as Arise, have made several points. And whatever point we make is just as valid as you know, in international media. I think it smacks of a bit of an inferiority complex. That's the point I was trying to make. But I like the point that the Honorable Minister made about the lives, the sanctity of the lives of soldiers and police officers, and that, how that is not being stressed. And I want to say that here at Arise, we have made an effort to really stress that and honor those lives that were sacrificed. You'll recall that one of the reports what was um, done at a police um, barracks with the children of the police officers expressing their anger and the hurt that they feel. Those voices are important and that position is valid, it must be said. So that point I will take. But I still find it quite sinister when a government continues to talk about regulating social media. I am not comfortable with that. I do believe in freedom of speech. I don't believe that you are free to, you know, Broadcast fake news, for example, that has to be, you know, um, criminalized in, case, in the event that it incites hatred, which is what the laws of the land say. But the fact that what you're posting, the government does not agree with, surely is not enough of a reason to, you know, regulate social media. I worry about that part. But the bottom line is that it will not go away. The other dimension, Peru. There was a protest in Peru. There was a brutal clampdown. The lives of peaceful protesters were taken, and immediately the interim president stepped down. That is the kind of transparency and accountability we would like to see. CNN did say that the um, Nigeria security agencies declined their requests you know, for their input into their reports. They declined to comment. I wish they had commented so that it's a balanced view, because being probed by the press that is the job of the media. The media is a watchdog. So we just need transparency. We need to stop having the same discussion going round in circles. What happened on the night of the 20th of October? This is the only question. Well, I don't envy uh, Alajilai Mohammed at this time. Uh, but moments like this occur. If you are speaking for government or you are speaking for any organization or any individual, and you have to do your best to manage this situation. Conceptually, what we're dealing with is uh, at one level investigative journalism. And that's why the CNN is saying we stand by our story. Mm -hmm. uh, we have investigated this story. We have taken every precaution. Uh, we have been careful and meticulous in arriving at this. And they even identified the tools that they use, uh, geolocation maps, timestamps, and they are insisting on their own integrity. Now, it doesn't mean that CNN is perfect. Yesterday, I made a point that, look, here in Nigeria, Premium Times did a detailed report. There were individuals who went to the scene and said, this is what we observed. 
But, and I said, okay, this, all this uh, excitement that has occurred, is it because it is uh, CNN? Uh, because, look, local uh, media had also already raised some questions. But the standard thing is to abuse local journalists. Now, let's leave that. See, there are two principles involved. There is, on one hand, the need to know which government stands by. Government does not operate on the basis of whatever happens, you just put in the public there. You must have the need to know. Because if government does not manage the need to know, you can destroy the country. You can violate national security. You could cause chaos. So government's information management process is guided by the principle of whether you have the need to know whatever it is. Government also recognizes that whatever crisis it has, its primary interest is to hold the country together, to ensure national security. And so even the security agencies are guided by information and how they handle it. That's one. It's a theoretical point I'm making. On the side of the people, the, the issue is the right to know. The citizen says, I have a right to know how my country is run, how it is organized, how the people in government are behaving. Then between that interface, you have the media that now says, OK, we are here to make sure that we bridge that gap between the need to know and the right to know. And that's why oftentimes journalists are taught that, look, focus and invest in investigative journalism. So oftentimes, when journalists investigate, you are bound to have that conflict, whether it is local journalism or a foreign media operating within your country. So this is not unexpected. That's the first point. The second point is that uh, Alaji Lai Mohammed is saying that uh, CNN will be sanctioned. How will CNN be sanctioned? Is the NBC, the National Broadcasting Commission, going to uh, impose a fine on CNN and say, CNN, you must pay this fine? Of course, CNN will say, we are not paying any fine. Or is the Nigerian government going to say, oh, we will expel CNN from the country because they have an office in the country? Or the Nigerian government will seal off the uh, offices, the premises of the CNN uh, in Abuja or wherever it is within the country. Those are not options that I will advise. But, you know, so when uh, uh, Alaji Lai Mohammed says uh, we will sanction CNN, okay, how? What are those sanctions? Maybe by the end of today, we will hear that CNN has been asked to pay 5 million naira or 10 million naira or 3 million naira. So I don't think it's even an option that they should consider. Three, the uh, Alaji Lai Mohammed spoke about uh, the young lady, Obia Nuju, uh, popularly known as uh, DJ Switch. Uh, he called her a fraud. He said at the appropriate time, uh, a matter will be addressed and all of that. Well, DJ Switch, as she's known, is already uh, uh, in Canada, we're told. And she's been accused of uh, aligning with destructive and evil forces. Now, I, I also don't think that that's a point that Alaji Lai Mohammed should have put in the public domain or to put it directly like that. Because if anything happens to that young lady, either in Canada or anywhere, you know, the Nigerian government could be accused of having gone ahead of her. But I think in the heat of the moment, you know, Alaji Lai Mohammed doing his job will feel that he has to put everything out there in the, domain, in, the, in the public domain. But I agree with him on the point about the policemen that died. Over 136 vehicles destroyed, 37 policemen killed, over 53 businesses uh, you know, uh, destroyed. I mean, if CNN had included that in their report, I think that, you know, that would have provided a sense of balance. And it will not look that the Western media, which we all know has its own narrative and a mindset, you know, um, so there could be an issue there. So I think along those lines, Alaji Lai Mohammed is right to draw attention to the fact that, look, this is not just about uh, protesters, uh, whether uh, this happened or did not happen. How about the policemen that lost their lives? What about the criminality uh, that took over uh, the entire uh, process. He has a good point there, and how CNN will respond. However, where CNN holds the stronger end of the stick is that they made an effort, according to them, to reach the Nigeria police, the Nigerian army, but nobody 
offer them any information. They even tried to reach the Lagos authorities, and they were told that, look, the matter is already before the judicial panel of inquiry. I think somebody dropped the ball somewhere. The alternative view, the comprehensive view that Alaji uh, Lai Mohammed was talking about should have been provided. Because now, with the altercation between the Federal Ministry of Information of Nigeria and uh, CNN, other news channels internationally are already taking up the story. I saw a story on Bloomberg. I've seen stories elsewhere. You know, some other news agencies may say, okay, can we also take a look at, at this particular story? So the handling of it is something we need to look at. But the issuance of threats, then the social media thing. Yes, Tundu, yes, we, we consistently defend freedom of expression there. Yeah. But there is, you must also agree that there is a lunatic French that is on social media. You know, a group of anonymous, inconsequential individuals who use the social media just to create chaos and disruption. Okay. I've written about it in the past, but the issue, of course, that the NUJ and the Guild of Editors are talking about is that there should be a pally, there should be a stakeholders meeting. Mm. And Elijah Lai Mohammed in the past has said he's not opposed to that. Okay. So where do we okay. draw the line between a lunatic fringe and people okay. who are using uh, social media for creative purposes? Okay. All right, uh, that's all on headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have uh, Rosa Sudiri, we'll have uh, Aaron Akirajala, and uh, we'll have uh, Michael Wilson, amongst other many other people we'll have on the show today to discuss COVID-19 sports and wretching of all the things. We'll be right back. Keep a look right here. All right, uh, we've got our dependable Rosa Sudiri to give us the Africa Business Summit. Rosa, over to you. Good morning, Rosa. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Tundu. Um, we begin with uh, the uh, Treasury bill space. Uh, we spoke with uh, a senior official at FMDQ. FMDQ is a, a financial markets integrated group that provides liquidity um, and also as an exchange. And they confirmed that Treasury bills, the true yield on interbank Treasury bills, have gone negative. It's, uh, it's quite, well, I mean, it was surprising, right? But with where rates have been falling uh, in the Treasury bill space, at some point, <laughs> we one, would, one would think that perhaps we would breach the negative region. Now, this is on the interbank, right? And so this is where the uh, banks trade between themselves. But it's a bellwether for the cheap bill auctions that I keep sharing here uh, with you, where we see the rates, you know, where we see the rates falling, when the central bank, when the central bank auctions um, T bills for you and I on the on the secondary secondary market, and essentially, you know, with rate, true yields falling into a negative region, pretty much means that you're essentially paying the government uh, to hold uh, money for you, and this is essentially why you're seeing. Um, uh, uh, funds going into the equity market. But for the sake of our viewers, I just want to uh, let folks know how to calculate the true, and I'm sorry that I'm doing this, <laughs> but it's a little academic. Your true yield, just to hold this here, is, a per, is your interest as a percentage of the face value of your treasury bill. So just, this is just an assumption here. You have an investment of 1 million naira that you want to invest in treasury bills. Let's assume that things were back in the heyday where we were having double digit rates, so at 10%, just to keep things simple. The key thing here is that your interest is paid up front, right? So you invest 10, 1 million naira in a treasury bill, you get as a 10%, 10% of 1 million is 100,000. So you get your 100,000 up front immediately. The 900,000 is then deducted from your account. Again, you are giving the federal government a million naira. They are giving you 10% uh, in return. So the key thing here is that your interest is paid up front. So if we now look at uh, um, what now happens as far as the calculation, true yield again, interest as a percentage of your treasury bill face value. You take your 100,000 in interest that you already have up front and divide it by the face value of 900,000 that's been deducted to your account. That's your face value. You get 11.1%. So the key thing here is that you have to hold your treasury bill to maturity in order to get the true yield. This is why treasury bills are attractive because your upfront interest allows you to earn more when you hold to maturity than what is actually offered, the initial 10%. But what we're seeing in the markets now is that this, the, the, the true yields now is now falling into uh, the negative space. So, I mean, going forward, we'll have to see what happens at the next auction and see if more funds flow into uh, the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Because again, 
There's not that many, not that many uh, options. Um, still on the banking side of things, Access Bank has be uh, begun to disburse the proceeds of their 50 billion Naira MSME loans for micro, small, medium enterprises, for enterprises that have been affected by the violence and vandalism following the NSARS um, protests. They say they got about 2,000 applications from MSMEs who you know, said that they were affected by the violence in the NSARS process. I think they said they've approved about 60 of them, and about out of the 60 they've approved, about 30 or so have been disbursed. Uh, the maximum tenure is 24 months, two years. There's a six-month moratorium um, on the loan. So they are giving MSMEs, uh, which are the engine of the economy, enough time to try to recover before they start paying back. But it's very necessary. Remember yesterday we were talking about the cause and effects of the vandalism uh, on the real estate sector. We, were, you know, we showed the mobility tracking, how less people were going to retail centers, less people were going to businesses. In fact, since what? March, when the pandemic, uh, lockdowns on the pandemic hit, there have been less people going to businesses. So these are the businesses that are being affected by less traffic um, coming to them. So they're in need. They, they've got working capital needs. They've got you know, profitability needs and so on and so forth. So it's good to see that the bank has now started to uh, disburse uh, those loans um, to those MSMEs that need them. Finally, South Africa, they held their interest rates, benchmark interest rate uh, as of 3.5% yesterday. Nigeria's MPC meeting is on Monday. The Central Bank is meeting, Monetary Policy uh, Committee. It's expected this is the last meeting for the year. I think they'll hold rates. However, inflation has been climbing. So maybe they might hike the rates. I mean, they cut it last time uh, to 11.5%. Mm -hmm. That's the benchmark rate. We'll mm -hmm. see what happens on Monday. Right. We'll follow up. Okay. Well, I mean, um, it's a good move by uh, Access Bank, considering what the bank has gone through in recent times. Uh, this may be a business repositioning strategy, uh, giving out interest-free loan. And moving ahead from that assault on the uh, Access Bank uh, uh, branches and all the uh, you know misconceptions about uh, you know the bank, so I guess this would further strengthen the bank. As for Treasury bills, I would like to know your advice. Treasury bills, you know, interest rates have been negative, and yet those bills um, have been oversubscribed. What is it that is inspiring? You know, the average investor in fee securities <laughs> to keep going in that direction despite the fact uh, that uh, the yield uh, is uh, on the negative side. But I would like to seek your leave to use this opportunity uh, to quickly pay tribute to uh, uh, one of the major figures in the financial sector in Nigeria who passed on yesterday, uh, Albert Okumaga, mm. uh, you know, uh, founder and managing director. Uh, chief executive of BGL Securities. He was a major player within the uh, financial sector. He was uh, president of the Institute of uh, Stock Brokers, 20, uh, Stock Brokers 2014 uh, to 2015, and he was regarded as a major figure, major player, you know, very committed and talented person within the financial services sector. As you will recall, uh, you know, he ran into trouble in 2015 when he was then sanctioned by the Securities and Exchange Commission, eventually in 2017, and he was banned for life uh, from uh, trading, uh, you know, as a st st uh, stockbroker. And that was uh, subsequent to a case in 2017, Rivers versus uh, BGL and 31 others. Uh, but what we have been told is that uh, he died of a heart attack, and uh, this uh, is a major loss uh, to stockbrokers who have been very effusive with praise for him and his uh, contributions. Mm. All right. And for those yes. of us who knew him personally, mm. you, know, uh, you know, we feel heartbroken, uh, but may God rest his soul. Amen. May he rest in peace. All right. In peace. Uh, uh, quickly, Rotus by extension, and like you said, good tribute to Abba Tokumagwe. In fact, he tried his hands on politics a little bit. Yes. A, he a governor. Uh, he, he ran for the primaries to become. He never got the primary ticket in Delta State. I remember then when he came campaigning and all of that. Uh, may God rest his soul. Uh, Rotus, most importantly for me, it's a good thing for Access Bank to give out the money. But I'm looking for something, and I normally use this word, which is supposed to be for fertility and growth, but I use it for the economy. I, I'm looking when is fecundity going to return to the economy in terms of spending? That's really very important because all the businesses can set up all the structures they have and get back to business.
But I noticed a sad trend. People are not spending. You brought the report to us a couple of days. There's no food traffic in the malls. So people are not going out there to spend money. Everybody's holding tight. Look at the inflation rate, budgeting inflation rate, core inflation and food inflation. Goodness me, it's like a double whammy now. When will people go out there and start spending? And what can the government do to push people out to spend the money they have so that we can have that level of fecundity in the economy again? It's, it's tough. In fact, we had a special on the uh, increase in fuel prices that we ran uh, yesterday where we were you know, going out and talking to motorists. With the increase in fuel prices, that's actually going to constrict the disposable income of Nigerians further. Um, so costs just continue to grow up. Cost of food. It's going to be interesting to see how Black Friday sales uh, play out um, in, the, in the next few days as we end up November and also see how Christmas is going to be. But I suspect that spending is going to be depressed um, for the Black Friday period and also for the Christmas period as well. Cost, every costs are going up. And as you said, too many blows to the Nigerian pockets. But before you go, I asked you about uh, investment advisory. Um, yes. Yeah, Doctor, it's, it's, um, Treasury bills are safe, and that's the reason why you're still seeing that they're they are, they are, they are still oversubscribed, because it's, you're lending money to the government. So the Nigerian government, worst case scenario, they can print Naira and pay you your investment back. So it's the safety one, two, there's just not that many options. If you want to take the risk, you can go into the stock market. The stock market, the returns are very high, but as I said earlier, the, the, the market was, it's cooled down a bit now. You want to wait until the market has come down a few more levels before you go in. But there's higher risk in the stock market as a higher, high risk, higher reward. So I would tell folks that you might want to just stick with the fixed income yields. They are low, but your investments are safe. If you want to take more risk, you can go into the stock market, but uh, you might lose some of your money. So that's just the risk you have to take. Do we have hmm. any updates about similar programs to the one you shared about Access Bank from other banks? and about other states. I know about Lagos SME's Recovery Fund, and they've had um, 2,000 applications. They have 81 approvals to pay money, and they've actually paid about 30 people. Do we have updates from other states? Not yet, um, but I will, we should hopefully get that uh, by, by Monday as the days, as the days pass. Thank well, you, Rutus. Thank you very much, Rutus. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much, Rutus. We'll move on to Michael Wilson now. He joins us for Business Now, World Business, report from London. Morning. I, Morning. I had a, a stockbroker once. I, I called him a broker because instead of making me richer, he made me <laughs> broker. That's <laughs> right. Ch Ch me broker. China, uh, first of all, then left its uh, one and five year loan prime rates exactly unchanged. Um, it's, that's a good signal, really, from China. What it means is they're not worried about their economy. It's firing all cylinders. But also, talking about uh, treasuries, it's, it is keeping its interest rates relatively high. So the, its, its government bonds, therefore, would be quite attractive to uh, investors. So after a, a sort of week, really, of, of uh, profit taking, um, sentiments lifted slightly in Asia about um, the US sides agreeing to talk about this to, or to resume stimulus talks. I'll give you a bit more detail about that in, in a moment. But, 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 but it's all just talk at the moment. Nobody's actually got together and um, we need to see some concrete uh, progress on that. So as far as the United States is concerned, let me give you a recap of what's been happening there. Um, and uh, if, if there is no fiscal package um, agreed, then 12 million Americans will lose their unemployment benefits. And um, the Federal Reserve's main lending programs would also uh, disappear. So therefore, it's quite welcome that uh, Senator Democrat Chuck Schumer uh, is saying that he'd like to start talks, we restart talks with the Republicans, uh, with the Republican Mitch McConnell, leader of the House there, in the face of the surging coronavirus cases around the country. Um, and uh, while we've seen some decent gains in the past week or two uh, on the back of various bits of vaccine news, um, the markets appear to be turning now, and I suspect this will last into next week, over slightly more short-term measure. They've, they've had a view of what the sunny uplands might be, or the end of the tunnel, whatever you care to call it, might well be. Um, but that is a long way away. And how we actually get there, I think, is consuming people right now. Um, and I think that probably explains, I mean, I could be wrong, but this is my general feeling, that why equity markets are actually losing a bit of their momentum right now. And uh, it's these short-term problems um, that are starting to chip away at some of that optimism. Um, however, however, um, there is additional news about uh, US Treasury. It wants 400 million, 400 billion rather, back from the Fed. Um, 
in the form of unused uh, CARES Act funds. This is this sort of uh, contribution that the Fed was making to people's uh, pay packets and so on. And that provoked howls of protest. It's, it's part of this kind of scorched earth policy that uh, the Trump administration, which of course is still there, appears to be doing at the moment, very much with their eyes perhaps on the election in four years' time, so that they can say, well, hang on a second, we're going to reverse some of this. That may be, that may be my suspicious mind thinking about this, but it does all look rather good. So there's about a $500 billion spread um, between uh, what the Democrats and what the Republicans actually are prepared to do as far as the stimulus package is concerned. Uh, will it come in time for Thanksgiving? Will it indeed come in time for Black Friday? Will it indeed come in time for Christmas? Who knows? Um, but uh, it would be a good policy win for um, the new administration, uh, and, and a slight incentive towards agreeing something with those worse than expected US jobless claims uh, yesterday. Uh, instead of 700,000 jobs, uh, initial claims, it's 742,000, which suggests that people are actually not being able to, re to restart work. Unemployment is rising. And I've said all along that if anything would cause this stimulus package to actually get into discussion, it would be a worsening economic picture. So we may be seeing this, and therefore it may well be that there is going to be some kind of agreement fairly soon. Let us hope so. Uh, talking of agreements, the, in, in, in the UK, the Daily Telegraph, one of our leading newspapers, which you know, um, has reported that a, a UK uh, Brexit, a UK-Europe Brexit trade deal could be agreed by as soon as this Monday. Uh, therefore, financial markets have been pricing that in. That's helped sterling, obviously. Uh, and um, I think we're talking about against the dollar one thirty-five now, which actually be, would be quite uh, would be quite ex exceptional, really. However, publics borrowing in September rose again, as you'd expect. I won't bore you with the numbers. Retail sales slightly up in October. In other words, people are still sort of going to the shops, but we haven't really had the proper figures um, in, in terms of what's happening with this terribly confusing picture we're getting at the moment about lockdowns. Region to region, is it going to be national? Is it going to be over Christmas? Are we going to be allowed to go out and so on? Nobody really knows. Can't say you blame many politicians for this, but but we wouldn't mind some clear guidance somewhere. Mm. Oil slightly up uh, overnight as a result of those renewed US fiscal talks, if they indeed take place. Gold, though, um, well, it's uh, actually um, it's down, dropped to 1850 overnight, mainly because, um, you know, if those fiscal talks actually got underway in the United States, there would be uh, less of a risk around as we speak. And it does all, all, everything that I've told you this morning, all points to these rather unpleasant facts that basically we don't know where we're going. But everything really depends upon China and the United States and their guidance as far as financial and indeed corporate business is concerned. Okay. That's your trade global view. I hope you have a lovely weekend. OK, I mean, have a great weekend, uh, Michael, you too. But, but I just have a quick question. I'm going to raise a point this morning about Turkey. Uh, Turkey, the country, not the one we'll have for Thanksgiving or the one most Americans will have for Thanksgiving. Uh, something is currently happening to the Turkish economy now. They've increased interest rate from about 10 points to about 15%. Uh, Recep Tide Erdogan had to fire his son-in-law that he made the finance minister before now because the economy was not just working. Is that telling us something? Yeah, I think I think it's telling us that hey, you've got a new finance minister there who's saying, right, I'm going to I'm going to give a stamp of approval to what's going on in the economy at the moment. I always have this thing about Turkey. You have to admire the fact. I mean, never politics apart, and it has got some very very difficult p politics to put it politely. Um, and and you know all the human rights and the rest of it, and the imprisonment of journalists and so on. However, it is an extraordinary manufacturing base which is not in the EU and. Germany and France have made excuses about the human rights record of Turkey for not getting it in the EU. I think the real, the real message that we're getting from the Germany, Germany and the France of the, of the EU, these big economies, they do not want a competitor of such manufacturing power that Turkey has actually um, within the EU. Turkey, if I can put it like this in geopolitical terms, fulfills a very, very valuable case for Europe. It keeps, it keeps revolutionary Islam to one side, 
uh, and I, I mean Islam, not uh, sorry, it, it, Islamism, revolution Islam to one side, and provides a nice barrier between that, those more extremes and the and that sort of uh, eastern side uh, of Europe. So, I mean, personally, I, I mean, I think it's a great country, uh, politics apart. Um, but that's what the, that's what the finance minister was doing. He was saying, "I'm going to raise rates," and I'm. Um, I'm fully confident about the way the economy is going. We'll see. Well, Michael, quickly before we go, if you can treat this in less than a minute, I'd like you to talk about Christmas. In the rest of Europe, Italy, uh, Belgium, Germany, France, everybody is saying that this Christmas is not likely to be any like any other, obviously. But there's some excitement in the UK about this five-day window that will be given. Uh, what is the consumer sentiment index like? Uh, is there going to be... High street, you know, uh, retail sales, a lot of enthusiasm. Would the people have the money to spend, spend and spend at Christmas? All right, so they've certainly got the money to do it because they haven't been spending it on anything else. I think there'll be a huge rise in online sales. The likes of Amazon and all the rest of them will do extremely well. I think the window will be quite exciting. I suspect that the pubs will be packed and all the rest of it, or as much as they can be, with social distancing. I think people will quite like that. I have to say, though, it just to me, it adds to the general confusion about things, because what happens after that? You know, we've, we've had talks about short breaks. We've had talks about circuit breakers. We've, we, we still do not know where we, whether we can actually go out or not. And, and until, as I keep saying, somebody gets rather brave about this and says, you know what, we are going to have to live with this. Yes, we have a vaccine on the horizon, but it'd be wrong to to get too much hopes about that. Shall we just learn to be responsible and live with this? That would that would be my answer. But of course, I'm just an observer. I'm not a politician. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. You know, you, you can say I'm wrong. If I'm a politician, no more life. Hopefully the stockbrokers will be able to say they are wrong too when they are.